Today's guest is Roger Whitney, the Retirement Answer Man. He has a new book on retirement and what the future of retirement looks like. Welcome to Richer Soul. Thanks for joining us today. I encourage you to check out the website for show notes, richersoul.com. One thing you won't find there is ads. I don't want anything to distract or entice you. I do have some Amazon links that are for books, and I do get a little bit of revenue if you buy the book, but I don't do it for the money. Rather, to track and see if people take action, and that's the easiest, fastest way that I know how. I share the most interesting articles that I read every week on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash rich or soul. So if you're interested in those, check it out. Do you wake up every morning excited, ready to face the day? When you look in the mirror, are you proud of the reflection staring back at you? Do you have the energy and health to do what you want? Are you in control of your time and have the time to enjoy life? Do you say thanks to the universe for the fact that you are lucky to be in the top 1% of the world for income? By that way, the the number for that is 30,000, just over 30,000 a year in income. Are you surrounding yourself with people who pull you up or are there toxic people tearing you down? Finding balance across all these areas is what we focus on here at Richer Soul. And in today's episode, we're going to examine a lot of those different areas. If you haven't had a chance to listen to episodes one through nine, I encourage you to listen to the framework behind Richer Soul and how to create balance in your life. You can also search back and see some of the coaching experiences I made into seven different shows so you can get a good idea of what coaching is like. Before we meet Roger, I want to talk to you about stock prices and value. Too often we look at the price of stocks incorrectly based solely on the price of the stock and not the actual value. Let's examine a few stocks. And these are based on the prices at the end of December 2017. We're also gonna look at the price to earnings ratio, which is the price of the stock divided by the earnings per share. So a PE ratio of 25 means that you are paying $25 for $1 of income. Right now, Honda sells at $34 a share. It has a PE of 9.63 and earnings per share of $3.17. Not bad for a $34 investment. On the other hand, Apple is trading at around $170. It has a PE of 18.51 and earnings per share of $9.21. So a bit higher, but still a tech company that seems to keep growing. Now we get to Tesla. Tesla's $317 a share. Its earnings per share are negative $8.66, which means there's no PE because there's no earnings. It's running in the hole. And that's why it may not be a great bet, even though everyone's excited about it. Another tech company is Amazon. Amazon is selling at almost $1,200 a share and it has a PE of 300, earnings per share of only $3.92. And while I I love Amazon and I'm constantly buying stuff from there, they're not really making a lot of money. And that's a little bit concerning. The last one we'll look at is Berkshire Hathaway, Warren Buffett's company. One share of Class A stock sells for $296,000. However, it's got a P.E. of 26 because it's got earnings per share of $11,356. By the way, I passed up buying these shares at $5,000 when I was young because I didn't understand the value of price versus the value of the stock. Just for some comparisons, the S&P currently overall has a P.E. ratio of 25. The historical low was 5.31, and the historical high was 123. One of the things you have to realize is that 
all boats follow the tide. What that means is in a rising tide, all boats go up, and in a falling tide, all boats go down. People are willing to pay more at times for earnings on stocks, and at other times, they're willing to pay less. It's always a good idea to buy stocks based on more than just the price. Also look at the earnings and look at the value you're getting and then determine what the future earnings are and whether or not it's worth making an investment there. In comparison, you can actually buy a lot of local businesses for PEs that are in the single digits. There's a lot less demand and it's a lot harder to get multiple investors into something like that. In real estate, we look at the 1% rule, which means that if you're buying a house, the rent should be monthly 1% of the purchase price. Depending on costs and real estate taxes and other fees, you could probably achieve a PE ratio of about 12 and a half, which compared to the stock market right now, sounds like a good deal. Again, I'm just trying to give you a little bit of insight behind the numbers and to encourage you to focus on the numbers when looking at making financial decisions. A little bit about Roger Whitney, the retirement answer man. His life work is cracking the code to creating a great life after age 50. Roger has over 27 years experience walking life with clients into and through retirement. He's the creator of the Agile Retirement Management Process, author of Rock Retirement, a simple guide to help you take back control and be more optimistic about the future, and host of the award-winning podcast, Retirement Answer Man. What does he care about most? Making the most of the only life he has by taking intentional steps to make it so. Being a great husband, father, and mountain biker. Let's meet Roger. Welcome to Richer Soul, Roger. It's great to have you join us today. Awesome to be here, Rocky. Such a cool name. <laughs> Thank you. So we always start at the beginning. What was it like when you were growing up and how much did your family and school teach you about money? I was a pretty scared dude when I was growing up. I didn't have a lot of confidence. I was fairly latchkey in my upbringing. And I don't think I really hit my stride as a person until my 40s. So it was a little rough in, in terms of feeling like you had direction. In terms of money, I didn't really have any direction about money. I worked since I was like 12 years old in my family's business. And then I think my first W-2 job outside the family was when I was 16 and I was Chuck E. Cheese. And I was always pretty decent with my money, but not great. And I paid the price for it in my 20s because I pretty much made decent money and spent every penny and more and had to sort of unlearn all that in my 30s. And then in my 40s, finally started to really make progress in my life financially anyway. Well, it's awesome. As long as you get there at some point, right? Yeah. You, you know, you sort of wish you would have known a little bit beforehand, right? And that's the hard part. You ask about the kids. I have a daughter who's 20 and a son who's 21. My daughter is a natural saver and my son is a natural spender. While they were growing up, I had them watch some Dave Ramsey stuff and we would talk about earning and saving. But I think it's something you have to learn for yourself in a lot of ways. About a year and a half ago, my son works at Starbucks. He's in college and they've always worked. So I think that I definitely instilled really well in them. But I had to ride my son like for six months to get his 401k set up at Starbucks, even though it was a part-time job. And he finally got that done. It's not that hard. What do you, you just click a couple of boxes on a computer somewhere or? It's that whole leader horse to water thing there, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All the, most of life isn't that hard if, as long as you are taking action in little incremental steps, but you got to be willing to do it. That's very true. You do have to be willing to do it. I guess I'm lucky. Well, although kids didn't do it, I set up Roth IRAs for my teenagers. They've already started having their retirement funded. And I did that instead of 529s. I tell my kids they can pay for their own college. I'll just help them have uh, the, the after college success. So it's working out well. So what happened in your 40s that kind of was that shift that all of a sudden 
things changed? It was a combination of things, Rocky. It was early 40s cleaned up a lot of things that were unaddressed life-wise. I think money was one of them. I'm an entrepreneur, so you know I went that entrepreneur journey of success, failure, success, failure, dreaming too much about the future and investing too much in the future and not enough today. But I think in my 40s, that got cleaned up where I felt like I, I figured it out. And also a lot of relational stuff in my marriage got cleared up and cleaned up. So everything became a lot healthier. You know, that might be a whole other show as to what precipitated that. But I think there's a lot of things. I got married when I was 23 and you get a job and you assume that your income's always going to grow and you make, you know, you make financial decisions with that assumption until you realize it doesn't work that way, right? And you can get smacked in the nose pretty hard. So it was a confluence of things that came together in my early 40s, and I feel like it's I'm a whole different person. That's pretty awesome, because you can reinvent yourself at any time you want, in a fraction of a second. It's a choice you make. Well, even when it comes to the parental stuff, in so many ways, I feel like early marriage and early children in the marriage, I was a pretty angry guy because I was had my own stuff I had to deal with. But then from a financial perspective, I'm trying to build a business that wasn't working or it was taking a lot longer than I thought. And I look back at that and see the kind of dad I was when my kids were younger. They probably got a real angry Roger. And then in some ways right now, even I'm 50 now and you know, I got a great relationship with my kids and Things are great, but I'm still it personally trying to remember that's not me anymore. That was Roger 1.0 or whatever you want to call it. And now we're on the new version, the much better version. Oh, yeah, the awesome version. <laughs> Just out of curiosity, did you have any mentors or coaches that helped you during that transformation? Well, I think a lot of it was I wasn't willing to have anyone. I think in my 20s, I had bad mentors or people that I was around. And then when I formed my partnership with my two business partners in 03, yeah, so since my early 40s, I've continually engaged a business coach, a life-ish you know, business with you know, also talking on the softer side of stuff. And it's really, I call it kerosene. It's really helped fuel a lot of my personal and professional production productivity be a better word and that's a hard thing to do because a lot of times it doesn't feel like it's that inexpensive and it's hard to see what the end result is right because really it's a series of conversations with someone that hopefully is wiser and can help guide you it's hard to quantify that but i'll tell you it's been it's been pretty incredible i'll always have a coach of some sort for my professional career anyway Oh, that's awesome. I just did an episode on what this year has looked for me from a, a standpoint of continuous improvement and the fact that I've I've invested probably over $20,000 this year on a variety of different things from coaches to programs to attending events and so forth. So I spent about an hour just chatting on all of those different things and how they all kind of come together. It's always good to hear from others when they also see the success that they get from coaches and mentors. And I think there's like a season for it. Right now, I think I'm in the season where I'm starting to wind down a few of those relationships so I can have six months to a year just to execute. Because I think you have to also be careful to have too many voices and new ideas coming in in your head, but definitely worth it. Yeah, I'm a big believer and I wasn't before. I'm actually going through that struggle myself of... Uh, the the theme for next year is execution. So it's like, okay, you got more than enough books. You've got more than enough knowledge. You've got more than enough programs. Start taking massive action. So I think I'm right oh, there with you. <laughs> the same season, because it's true, because personal development and I, you know, idea creation and strategy is great, and it can be a good avoidance behavior for execution. Ah, Great insight. Yeah, sometimes people want to keep learning and not take action. 
I remember that. That that was the days of college, right? When kids went for seven (laughs) years and then came out and decided to go back for a different degree. (laughs) Exactly. Can't do that in adulthood. So I asked you here today because you have a new book coming out called Rock Retirement. And after going through it, I think there's a lot of wise insights in here. And I'd love to just chat a little bit about it. One of the things that you talk about is the standard wealth formula, which I think we all know that the the simple way to do things, create a budget, maximize the 401k. You know, if you've got extra, put put it in the IRA, get rid of your debt, and then save every extra penny. And yet you say that this isn't going to work so much anymore. Why do you say that? Well, in my in my my world, it's about retirement because I only work with clients over 50 that are at that point. And I think the problem is retirement planning grew up for our parents' generation where they had pensions or typically had pensions. They lived a lot. Uh, they didn't live near as long as we're pro- likely going to live. And the retirement was a lot simpler. They were worn out from physical work. And retirement, I always say my grandfather, who's Zig, when he retired, I mean, retirement to him was moving to Florida and just being able to rest and read and go to the, you know, the the special uh, at the diner. The saving and investing mentality of what's your number, finding a financial number worked because you had all these things going on. And I think what's happened is as baby boomers are becoming retired or working towards retirement, all of a sudden everything's changed. Typically, we don't have pensions. We're going to live a lot longer than our parents or grandparents did. Right now, a 60-year-old has a 50-50 chance of living past 90. That's incredible to me, and that's increasing, and that's not you know, adjusting for social, economic, racial, and all the other issues. That's just on average. During retirement, and I'd be interested in your thought on this, Rocky. During retirement, you know, whereas maybe our parents said they were looking forward to resting, most people seem, at least in my experience, when they talk about retirement, they talk about living. They talk about being able to finally do the things that they want to do. And I would agree. I think that that is a changing thought that's coming about now is that people want more out of retirement and the word retirement is kind of shifting as to what it truly means. I think it's it's doing what you enjoy because you enjoy doing it and it's not necessarily the golf course and the that type of a retirement lifestyle. When I pull my podcast listeners, the word that overwhelmingly gets picked is freedom. Freedom to do things on your own terms rather than the corporate terms in most people's cases. That's the perfect word. And so we have this shift from how past generations retired and how baby boomers or our generation looks at, you know, the second half of life. I think the problem is, Rocky, is that from a financial planning perspective, and I used to teach the retirement planning segment of the certified financial planning curriculum, it grew up focused only on saving and investing. And that's where that, you know, that phrase, what's your number? How much do you, how big a pile of cash do you need to have to be secure in retirement? That's where that came from. And the whole process is geared to figure out what you need what your gap is going to be, and then the typical prescriptions are, okay, if it doesn't work, then you're going to have to start saving more now, which is a direct cost on your life. You're going to have to work longer, which is a direct cost on your future life, or you're going to have to settle for less later on, which is a direct cost on your entire life. Those are all really horrible choices, and it's all because everything is focused down to making your life like a math problem. And it may make math sense, but it doesn't make a lot of human sense because there are a lot more things we have control over than just simply how much we save and invest. That's where the conversations are coming now. It's 
what is it that you want to do? How does that fit into a bigger plan? It's what drove me up the wall. I would go to financial planners forever. And they would tell me, oh, we look at you holistically. We look at all your money. And at the end of the day, after being them with them for a while, the only thing they would look at was their pile of money. They wouldn't look at my 401ks. They wouldn't look at the rest of the stuff. They'd never ask me questions about the bigger parts of life and what I wanted to do and what I wanted for outcomes for the money. They just kind of did the math problem. I think that's changing. I've been meeting a lot more people who are involved in financial planning who won't even look at your numbers until they have the first question of, tell me about your life, your goals, what is it you're looking to accomplish? The problem I find is that most people don't have those answers. What's been your experience? One, it is slowly changing from a financial planning standpoint. I think we got a long way to go because most financial planners aren't versed in the softer stuff. Financial planning still ends up being a means to an end from an investment sale or getting assets, just from a business sense. But to your point, a lot of people don't know what they want. You know, I'm 50. You ask me where I want to be 10, 15 years from now. I probably have a better clue than most people just because I think about this stuff a lot. But it's not like it's some crystal clear 4K picture. You know, it's just some, oh, I think it wants to be this. So I think that is a good question. And I think one way you have to approach it is to, and this is the hard part with retirement planning, is not try to put too much pressure on actually getting the right answer. Because there isn't the right answer. I mean, now how long have you been married, Rocky? 22 years. Okay, you've been married. Yeah, a good while. All right, I've been married 27. And so what I always say is, Although I've been married 27 years, I've been married to like four different women. (laughs) Because she's a version of who she was at 23, but she's not the same lady. And she won't be the same lady three years from now or 10 years from now. That person, just like me, is going to have different priorities, different wants, different desires, how are we supposed to decide what we want 60 year old look like when we don't even know who that person's going to be? What I say is you definitely have to make some reasonable assumptions of the direction you want your life to go in terms of needs, wants, and wishes. But more importantly, you need to have a system in place where you can have lots of little conversations so you can continually adjust those desires so you can make small little adjustments to your financial situation along the way. So that you're ready for whatever happens with life. Right. I mean, think of it like an airplane. You know, if if Rocky is an airplane and he is where he is today and retirement is 65, well, you may say you want to go to L.A. right now, but you may end up really wanting to be in Calgary or Vancouver or the Caribbean. The idea is you want to keep making little adjustments and checking in so you can adjust your course of your entire life as where you think you want to go alters as well. Do people still really want to wait till 65 to retire? Or I guess that's not the right word because I don't think I'm going to stop working. But what work is is going to consistently change over time, I think. In other words being able to say no to all the things I don't want to do. And I think that's one of the biggest problems of traditional retirement planning is it looks at work and retirement as a light switch, right? You're either working or you're not. And that's how the planning goes. I think a more productive way to think about it is like a dimmer switch. If at 60, you have a 50-50 chance of living another 30 years If it's just about how much money you got, it's going to be hard to make that work. So I'm a big fan of what I call pre-tirement, which is that in-between stage where you leave your traditional work and all the obligations and you discover work that you can do that, one, it may be your calling, whereas your profession may not be your calling or your interest. And you work for a lot less money, but you have more time freedom so you can enjoy the best of both worlds. 
And I think that's a big solution for a lot of people. And there are some huge benefits from that, not just from the economic sense, but one thing that I've, I've seen in my years, and I bet you've seen this, Rocky, is a lot of times people focus on retirement because they're trying to remove the pain of what they're doing, whether it's the travel, the meetings, the corporate politics we have to deal with. So everything is focused on pulling the pain out of their life, and then they wind up in retirement, and they don't know what to do. They've never thought about the after. They just wanted to get rid of the pain. And I think switching to what could I do that will give me social connection, purpose in life, plus some income, I think makes it a lot more exciting to, to think about what that 3.0 Rocky would be in this instance. Absolutely. I'm literally living through that at this moment. I'm just slightly older than you. I'm 52. And I say, if I look at 30 years going forward, it's hard to fathom. So I, I said, well, what does 30 years look like going backward? And I go, 22 to 52. Oh, my God, that was a long time. Yeah. And that was a lot of growth and a lot of change and... 22 probably would not have imagined this 52, and so here I am, 52, looking at 82 going, huh. And that's what this podcast is all about, that journey for me, is that change, because this is what I'm going towards. I've always loved money. It just drives me up the wall that we have all this abundance in this country, and there aren't more millionaires, because it's not that difficult. This is my building of that retirement thing in the in-between type of a situation. When I'm 72, between Social Security, rental income, and, and my investment portfolio, I will have more money than I know what to do with. But I need to do something in the, the in-between time. Yeah, and it may not be about being a millionaire. It may be about, I know people that have made decisions to live a more balanced life because it's it's what they value right now. Now you got to do it in a prudent way. I am very intentional about my life right now of, if you asked me, I may work a little bit too much right now, but I'm trying to live life on my own terms even now. And over the past eight years, I've worked really hard to structure my business and my life like it is now, where right now I'm talking to you from my home office. I'm pretty much location independent. I got clients all over the country. That's by intention because I was trying to create a life where I could have a lot more time freedom and not have to go to an office every day. That's nice because then you, you're in a happier place probably, aren't you? Yeah. My big struggle is I'm enjoying so much of what I'm doing is that I tell myself it's all fun and I forget to just go out and have real fun that's outside of work. Ah, I end up okay. of work so I got to work on that. <laughs> I don't have that problem. I have no problem just going out and enjoying life. Okay. Occasionally, I come back and take care of the work stuff as well. And so that's a question, you know, money versus happiness. And I think you talk about that in the book a bit as well. I'd be interested in your thought on it. I think it's, there's a balance. It's not about more. It's about creating the kind of life you want. I just talked to a couple this morning that are in their early 30s, they don't own a house. They are living nomadic lifestyles and working remotely wherever they are. Now, to someone like you and I in our generation, that seems very imprudent, right? They're not saving, they're not investing, they're not buying that house and paying down that mortgage and everything else. But if you look at, say, a 20-year-old like my daughter, she has a 50-50 chance of living past 100 most likely, she's going to have multiple careers in her life. If you look at somebody in that age group who is going to have a lot more longevity, probably a lot more health than past generations, and multiple careers, there's less of a rush like you and I probably felt when we were coming out of college. I remember I felt like I was on a rail. I had to get the job. I had to do all these things. I'm the same way. I still, though, would think for a young couple like that, I, and I don't say you have to buy a house because I think 
that doesn't necessarily make sense anymore, and it depends on the markets you're in. But I think creating profit in your life and setting aside that profit throughout life in your 20s and your 30s is what gives you that financial base so you can say no to whatever you want to say no to. I definitely agree with that. If you think of it, everybody's life is like a business. You want to have free cash flow, which is excess money after your expenses. That's how you build wealth is generating free cash flow. And the question is, that's basically wealth. Free cash flow is wealth. And it's just a matter of what do you do with it? And I definitely, I'm not saying that you need to just spend every dime. I think you do have to be prudent in saving for the future. I just think that there's a lot more balance than I, I think I, you or I felt when we were at that age. And that's true. I was intentional with certain things. I would look at the corporate side and I realized, oh, I could get this promotion. But if I take this promotion, I'm going to make this much more, but I'm going to work twice as hard. Throughout my career, I said no to all of those. I'm like, I'll make less as long as I can keep my freedom in time. I'm happy with that decision. Good. That's awesome. That That is a smart way to do it. And I think too often people get put on a track, as you said. The companies want to keep pushing you forward and trying to keep you locked in. And I, it's good that nowadays people are saying no much more so. So I think that's really good. Companies, and this isn't in a horrible, mean way, they are not human. An employee, a, a worker, even a business owner in their own business, they're a widget. They are input to help in the productive capacity of a company, even if it's your own company. The very nature of those kind of organizations are that they always want more for less. It's incumbent on all of us, and I'm dealing this with right now in my business, which I own, of putting limits on what that actually means. Don't think that you're an employee, you feel like you're acted upon. It happens the same thing if you run your own business. Because my business demands more and more and more and more of me unless I put limits on it. And I guess it goes back to, from a human perspective, being willing to understand who's really in charge of your life. It's you, not the company you work for, and it's up to you to set those limits. Absolutely. And I think you talk a little bit about that in the book with regards to the topics of health relationships, and purpose. I talk a lot about that on Richard Soul is, is knowing your purpose and being clear and telling it to the universe and then building those excellent relationships and also about health because without health, everything else falls apart. Let's just take, so I deal with boomers, so I'm going to focus there. So let's take uh, a boomer. We want, let's talk about the best investments someone can make. So number one is going to be investing in your health. And that sounds trite, right? We all know we should eat better and we don't. We all know we should exercise and we don't do it enough. But here's the plain fact is that if you don't invest in your health in this age of longevity, you'll probably live almost as long as you would have anyway. It's just going to suck more. Because you're not going to be able to do the things you want to do physically later in life because you didn't invest. Now, I'm 50 and I'm investing with the idea of making sure I'm set up well for my 60s and 70s. There have been some studies on health care costs to put an ROI on how much more it costs, a return on investment and how much more it costs to, in health care costs, if you're unhealthy relative to your healthy. I think Fidelity did one. And it's a lot more money. But I think there's a lot more human cost involved than we realize. Again, past generations, when they retired, they were sitting on the park bench of life for the most part. They were done doing. They were happy just to rest. Now, when we retire, it's more about being on the playground. So I think investing in your health is probably one of the best investments you can make. And then the second one is investing in relationships, which I think is huge. We forget when we leave work, we also leave a lot of our relationships and our purpose. It just disappears. 
And what can happen, and I've seen it happen, is as we get older and older, we fail to renew our relationships, especially outside of work, and build a vibrant social network. And then as we get older, then people pass away, or they get ill, or they move on. And statistics show this. As you get older, it's very likely, if you're not intentional, you get a lot lonelier. There's a huge human cost to that. The flip side of that is a good friend of mine, Dan Miller, who he's 70 years old. The man has the most vibrant network of people I've ever met. He's constantly fostering it to where I'd say a good percentage of his friends that, and I count myself as one of them, are much younger than he is. He's one of the most alive, creative energetic kind of guys I know, but he's been very intentional on that relation aspect as well. So we, get, we can't forget to invest in those. And it sounds trite because it's not numbers and cents. My opinion is going to have a heck of a lot bigger impact on the quality of your life than the money. I think you're correct in that. And I've seen some of Dan Miller's work and some of the things he's doing, and it's incredible. When I listen to him, he's got it going the right way. That's cool that you have uh, such a wonderful friend, too. Yeah, he's a good guy. So as people sit down and think about this, I think this is where people struggle, is how do you sit down and figure all these different things out? Yeah, well, the, the book is a framework for that. My suggestion would be is the key to it all is... You have to look out and just make some reasonable assumptions on where your life is going and where you want it to go. But then we got to zoom back down. And I like to set little action steps. I call them SMART sprints. So SMART is an acronym for goal setting. Specific, measurable, actionable, realistic, and time-bound. You can Google that and there'll be a whole framework for it. I like to set smart sprints, meaning no longer than 60 days, 60 to 90 days, where, okay, you look up and you figure out where you want to head directional, and then you zoom back down and say, what can I do in the next 90 days to move myself or our family forward to that in that direction? Those smart sprints can be around a couple different areas. They can be around your network. That could be a professional network is probably the biggest resource you have. Yeah, you have net worth, but probably the bigger resource you have, depending on how old you are, is your ability to earn income. What can you do in the next 90 days to position yourself to increase your earnings potential? And that could be skills. You can invest in skills. You can invest in your professional network. You could progress externally or internally. There are a lot of things you can do to increase your earnings potential. Another area is obviously your finances, and that could be building up your 401k savings, or it could be building an emergency fund. It could be paying off debt. But I think the key is you zoom out. Where do you think you want to go? You zoom back down, and you figure out the next step that you take. The value of that, Rocky, is... One, you get lots of little rewards because you set a reward around them. So you actually see it getting done. So it's not so distant in the future. And two, because they're little steps, when you look back out over the horizon and realize you need to adjust your course because your values have changed or your priorities have changed, then you can zoom back in and make a a new smart sprint that is reoriented to where you want to go now. That's a great recommendation. People need to sit down and take the time to think about where do I want to go next? What are the action steps that will get me there? Now, I know in the book you talk about intentions versus actions. Now is probably a good idea to talk about that. (laughs) Well, and I also want to say uh, when you're looking far out, don't put so much pressure on yourself to figure it out. It's okay. Just swag it. Just do a guess on it based on what you value. Intentions versus actions are, it's sort of like ideas. Everybody puts values in ideas, a business idea, an app idea, whatever the idea is. Ideas are actually not worth much money. It's really the 
the ability to execute on ideas is much more valuable than an idea. It's the same thing with intentions versus actions. I've had lots of great intentions in my life and took no action on them, and they're worthless. That is true. The two biggest ones are probably diet and exercise and budgets. We all have the, the intentions in those two areas, but you don't take action on them. You've got, to, you've got to put them on your calendar and make them habits that occur automatically. A really good book on the budget, real quick, because I just read this book. Yeah. It's geared towards small business owners, but you could totally apply it. In fact, I do. I call it something different, but you could totally apply it to the personal life. It is a book called Profit First by Mark Makowitz or some crazy name, Profit First. But it's a great structure. If you hate budgeting, which I sort of hate budgeting, it focuses on helping you capture that excess income from a behavioral aspect rather than a spreadsheet aspect. So that might be something to check out. The audiobook is really good because he just throws in commentary. He's a pretty funny guy. I don't use the word budget in the sense that I don't promote that. What I promote for people to do is to create a cash flow statement. So run your life like a business, create your cash flow statement, look at where your money's flowing, and then evaluate. Is this where you want it to flow in the future or not? And if you don't like where your money's flowing, change it. But you can't do any of that until you first figure out what's going on and where's it going and see if it's in line with what you want it to do. We get our credit card statements, you know, at the end of the month, it's like thousands of dollars. I'm looking at this going, <laughs> wait a minute, there's nothing big on here. Everything's double digits. And yet that's how thousands of dollars go through the budget every month and 20 here and 50 there and 14 at this. And it adds up faster than you can imagine. And if you don't sit down and create that cash flow statement to see and then direct your flow to where you want it, it's never going to happen. Very smart. The other thing I did, which is profit first, is I have all my things automated to savings. I, since right when I got out of college and I started a job, I just created all these different automatic systems that would take money out of my bank account or my paycheck before I ever saw it and just put it somewhere else. Whatever was left, I spent. So I didn't have to have a budget. I just knew there's money in the bank. I can spend it. And I knew that since I was paying myself first, all the other stuff got funded and it happened without me even having to pay attention or do work or make a decision every month. Very smart. Very smart. It just occurs. I don't know why more people don't, uh, well, they don't teach about that, which is a shame. People just set up their automated savings. They could forget about the rest of this stuff and go on living life. You're exactly right. You're exactly right. What do you think about entrepreneurship as a retirement plan? Ooh, I think it's a great way to blow up your retirement plan. Do you? Uh, it can be. Uh, well, I think I, I love entrepreneurship. I am an entrepreneur. Um, I, I guess you need to define your terms a little bit more because they're solopreneur, right? Someone that you know works remotely and is a sole proprietor, and then there's buying a franchise. There's a lot of benefits to being an entrepreneur, earning income, working on your own terms. Where I see people get in trouble, Rocky, is most people are kind of preneurs. They're attracted to being an entrepreneur, but they don't really want to do everything an entrepreneur has to do from a risk level, management level, time level. They're kind of preneurs in that they want to buy a business and have it cash flow immediately. They want to buy a business and not have to actually work in it. Those are rare. And if you can create one, it takes a long time and probably a lot more money and turmoil than you think it does. I do like entrepreneurship, but get a really walk that way carefully because you can waste a lot of money in investing in something that really isn't going to serve you. When I said that, I think I was thinking more of a solopreneur who was doing what they loved and making a little bit of money at. Oh, I totally love that. Totally love that. We talked about earlier, depending on where you're at, you may have a shortfall in your budget by kind of figuring out how to 
build a, a small business around what you love and bring in a little bit of income, it kind of helps to shift those equations and gives you a little bit more flexibility and the ability to, as you said, I think before the dimmer switch, it's one step along the way. So here's a great example of that, of someone who did it very well, I think. And this is a, a client and he was a rancher. He has a ranch that he goes to every weekend. He loves being outside. He came to me maybe four years before he retired and said, I think I want to start a lawn care business. I love being outside. I love riding the tractors and everything else. He started to add up the cost of all the things he needed to do when he retired to get it going. All the equipment, how to get clients, all that planning stuff. And my suggestion to him was, since we were three or four years out, which was smart, it's like, hey, why don't you just go get a lawn right now? Don't buy any equipment. Use what you have and go test it. Start with one lawn right now while you're still working. Do it on the side and test to see how that goes for six months in terms of you being out there mowing, maybe hiring contract labor to help you and servicing the customer and everything else. Test it now while you still have your day job to see if this is really what you want to do. And so he did that and he discovered contract labor is hard to keep in terms of reliability. Customers are sort of a pain sometimes. You know, it's hot here in Texas. So he tested it and realized it wasn't for him while he still had his day job. I think that's a much smarter approach for a lot of us is the time you want to start thinking about that entrepreneur or side hustle is while it's really side hustle and you still have your day job. So where you can ease into, you can experiment without making it have to work. I would concur on that is that's definitely a much easier way to go, especially if that side hustle is dramatically different than what your regular yeah. job is. If it's kind of an extension of your regular job, it's probably a little bit different. Yeah, and if it's an extension of your regular job, then what you can do while you still have your regular job, that would be a smart sprint of starting to invest in the network internally in that industry so you can have, whether it's board opportunities or consulting opportunities, you can have a robust network outside of your company to turn to to try to get some of those engagements. Absolutely. One of the more important things, though, is to test it. I think too often, and, and I see that even with younger kids, I want to be a doctor, I want to be a lawyer, and they, they get to finishing medical school and coming out of uh, law school, and all of a sudden their eyes are open to what it means to be in those professions, and they're like, we made the wrong choice, and now they feel stuck because they've spent a lot of time and money to get there. And so being, you know, testing out your theories of if this is what I want to do, is it really what I think it is? Taking small steps instead of committing yourself to a plan that may not end up being what you love. Excellent point. That's an excellent point. Let's just shift gears a little and talk about the financial planning industry. You may have mentioned it in the book, or it may have been, I think it was in the book. Great presentations don't make great investments. It seems to me that a lot of people in the financial planning industry are salespeople. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yes. Disclaimer, this is not disparaging people. This is just the way the financial industry is set up. In, is that I went to training at Payne Weber, which is now UBS, the largest private bank at the time in the world. Financial advisors are trained on two things primarily, sales presentation and product knowledge. And the business structure is to go out and gather assets and put, match them with investment vehicles. That is primarily what we're trained on. We're not trained on, on 
relationships. We're not trained on conflict resolution. We're not trained on life planning or coaching. We're trained as investment people. And the vast majority of us getting into the industry, I'd say almost everybody, when you get into the industry, it is, okay, go find clients and you will eat what you kill, meaning that when you get clients, you'll make, whether it's fees or commissions, and if you hit certain bogeys, you're allowed to stay. That's how we all get into the business for the most part, which sets up a dynamic of most of the most successful advisors in a lot of cases are really the most successful salespeople. It has nothing to do with helping you define and work towards goals that you really want. Now, I'm not saying that people don't have good intentions and that they don't want to do that. There are plenty that are much better than I am. Amazing advisors. I count myself as hoping to be one of those one day. Doesn't mean there are they aren't there, but from an industry standpoint, like any industry, it's about more and it's about sales. People should be aware of that is that the people that they are talking to have certain goals and they may not be in alignment with your goals. So you've got to understand your money better than anyone. It's also emotionally, we as the consumer of financial advice are wired to try to go away from the pain. So what ends up happening is, and I've seen it time and time again, I've been doing this 27 years, is when markets are hot. I remember the 1990s when it was all the internet craze investment products came out in response to people wanting more risk and more potential returns and to get in on the quote unquote new economy at the time. If you look at the introduction of new financial product, it matched what people were demanding because they didn't want to miss that ride. Demand says we want, we don't want to miss the ride of the new economy. So the financial industry comes up with tons of new product to help them do that. Usually it's towards the tail end when the market cycled the other direction, which happened in that case. And then when we have really bad markets, then you can look back at you know where money's flow, you see the exact opposite happening. Now, remember after the crash of the new economy, the tech boom, when everybody was afraid again, then we saw this huge rise of the first principal protected investment vehicles where you could have some market participation and still have some protection on the downside. We saw the rise of those products to meet the demand of everybody that was scared. All the same things happen at 308 and everything else. So I guess my point is, when we're talking to a financial advisor or even talking to ourselves about what we should be doing, we have to remember that if we're afraid, there's probably somebody, we're, we're probably along with a lot of other people, and there's going to be somebody to fill the market to present you a product that will solve that emotional need in the short term. That doesn't mean it's the best thing to help you get to where you want to go in terms of fees, in terms of potential returns and complexity and everything else. And that's one reason why you want to have a really prudent way so you can dampen that, that optimism or that greed from an investment standpoint when things are really good. And you can also put a floor on the fear and the emotional aspects when things are really bad so you can make more prudent decisions. And unfortunately, because of the, you know, just how the financial industry grew up, you're probably going to get presented a lot of things that are putting a duct tape solution over an emotional problem rather than something that's really helping you move to where you want to go as a family. And I think I would very much concur with that. And, and along the same things, I know as I was building wealth, I would always be listening to the TV and all the talking heads and talking about how the market's doing. And I've learned to turn all of that off because I found out they don't have the answers. Their product is your eyeballs. So they need to keep your eyeballs there so they can sell advertising. Correct. So they're always hyping things. It doesn't matter whether they make money or lose money. It's just that you're constantly there paying attention to them instead of yourself. Yeah. And it's, and it's very, you know, and you're right. I mean, I do the same thing. I mean, I'm probably one of the least informed 
day to day what's going on in the world than most people because I intentionally am very selective about what I allow into my ears because I am human just like everybody else, right? I will be greedy and fearful depending on what I put into me. Uh, the easiest way I've, I've to solve that is to turn the TV off. And then you don't have that. Now, unfortunately, it shows up on your iPhone. <laughs> so you got to turn that off, too. And uh, try and shut it all down and have the time to think through these difficult questions and see what works for you and be purposeful in what you want and not what everyone else wants for you. I think that's the biggest change. When we were growing up, you know, there was the American dream. This is what you do. You know, you get a job and you buy a house and you have two kids and a dog and you'll be thrilled with your nice yard and life is wonderful. I think people now are saying, you know what, that's not necessarily my dream and it doesn't necessarily bring about happiness. And I think a lot more people are questioning it, which is good. Out of curiosity, I always try to ask when I talk to people in the financial markets, you know, we're at a point in time where stock markets are at all-time highs. The bond market is also at all-time highs, and yet it continues to go higher. I, I think people aren't paying as much attention these days to the stock market because everyone has been blinded by Bitcoin. Uh, <laughs> what are your thoughts about the market today and about reducing risk? That's a hard one, isn't it? So here's my philosophy is I don't want to put my clients, you know, ability to achieve their goals based. I don't want it to be based off of my intuition of overvalued, undervalued and et cetera. Let me approach it from a different angle. And this is a good time to do it when markets are at all time highs is stop trying to predict the future. Nobody can do it. People that spend their entire lives trying to do market forecast, economic forecast, have a miserable record. Miserable. So why are we spending any time trying to do it? And why are we spending any time listening to these people when they clearly can't do it? And they spend their entire lives and are educated to do this. The more we spend trying to predict the future, the less time we're focusing on things we actually have control over. From an investment standpoint, I think what happens is most people determine their investment, say their target asset allocation, based on a risk tolerance questionnaire of some sort. You know, you fill out, you remember filling those out, Rocky, right? I do. Yeah, there are you know, nine or 10 questions that Gauge what level of risk you can tolerate from an investment standpoint. And then what it does in theory is if it knows what your tolerance is for risk, then it will maximize or optimize your asset allocation to try to give you the best returns for that given risk level. That is standard practice in our industry. It makes total sense from a compliance standpoint for sure because we have to make sure we understand the risk levels our clients can handle. But here's the problem with that. And I think this goes to your question of one thing I have found in working with hundreds and hundreds of people, helping them map their goals and how much risk they need to achieve those goals is the majority of the time people are taking too much risk, especially when we're focused on things we can actually control. The problem with the risk tolerance questionnaires, you know, so you, you answer the 10 questions. It tells you what your tolerance is for pain, meaning market volatility, and then it positions a portfolio to maximize a return there. So let me just say that a different way. If you take that questionnaire and we assume it can actually measure your risk tolerance, how much pain you can handle, let's assume it actually can, and that's very questionable, and then it positions a portfolio to achieve the, hopefully the best returns for that given level of risk. Another way of saying that is if you implement that portfolio – Statistically, you're almost guaranteed to experience the maximum amount of pain or volatility that you say you can bear based on those questions. Why? I can tolerate a lot of different types of things, Rocky, but I choose probably not to go to that level with most of them. So if you and I were standing in front of each other, and we've met many times, 
if I guessed and I'd be optimistic, I could maybe handle three punches in the face from you. <laughs> I, I'm giving myself some credit. You're, you're probably thinking, you're, ah, one punch and you're done, Whitney. <laughs> But if I say I can tolerate that, why would I position myself to almost statistically guarantee I'm probably going to experience that when no punches to the face is more than enough? So when I work with clients, the way I approach it is what's the minimum effective dose of risk that can position us for success in what we say you want to accomplish? It gets away from what's going to happen next in the market and it it goes to the point of the only reason to take investment risk, whether it's in bond markets or stock markets, is because we need to get us someplace we care about most. So I think that's one important thing for us to think about. The other thing I think is important to think about is, and this is, I think, more to your question, I think you have to have a good portion that is targeting an asset allocation, but I do think you also have to have, that's the science of investing. But the problem with the science of, say, asset allocation and long-term averages and everything else is that it assumes really long-term timeframes. You know, at, say, age 60, 30, 35 years may seem like a long time to you, but it's not in statistical terms. It's actually a pretty short period of time. A lot of studies have shown that if you have really bad returns early in retirement, you really handicapped yourself. So I think you do need to have a bit that's tactical, meaning leaning away from overexpensive assets and towards underexpensive assets and, that, and make some really concrete decisions of how you decide what those numbers are. Uh, so I do think it, a blind asset allocation is probably not a great idea. I do think you need to have some art to the science as well. I agree with you. I think there's a lot of art to the science. Now, looking backward, it's a lot easier for me because I've been through multiple bear markets that I know how I'm going to react and I know going forward what I'm going to do differently. But I don't think people realize until they, they go through it. And the problem is, is, you know, they happen, what, every seven years on average until you actually go through it and you watch hundreds of thousands of dollars disappear from your account, you don't know how you're going to react. <laughs> In retirement, when you're going, you're going through these and you left your career and you're not saving anymore, you got a lot more psychological and emotional things to deal with too. Absolutely. That would be freak out. And so that creates a problem because I know that's my biggest problem is I'm relatively young and I'm... I don't need more money per se, but I'm building for that margin of taking the hit. I don't know if that's the right way to do it or not, but I'm creating a large margin. So if I do get hammered, I still have enough. I don't know of a better way at this point. The key is to not wing it and to have some reasonable approach that you've settled on. Otherwise, you'll just read the next article and the next blog and keep changing strategy. Yeah, at this point, I'm locked and loaded, I think, on strategy, and I'm building multiple streams of income. So this stream will handle a downturn in that stream. And by combining different ones together, it creates a much stronger foundation. It just takes time to execute, and it's during that time and the journey that we have to enjoy life. He is to have that balance with it for sure. Absolutely. Is there anything that we should have talked about that we haven't had a chance to talk about yet? We covered a lot of things, man. <laughs> we always do. That's what, that's what my guests always say. We covered a lot of stuff. I think we've covered uh, the majority of things. A lot of the, a lot of the more details and some of the resources are in the book, but uh I think we've covered pretty much everything. I am going to encourage people to get the book, Rock Retirement. And Roger's actually got a special offer for us, don't you, Roger? Yeah, if you go to rogerwhitney.com forward slash richer soul and enter your email, we will give away five books randomly to whoever enters their email in there. So go to rogerwhitney.com forward slash richer soul, put your email in and Whoever wins, we'll send you out a free book, shipping and everything. 
that's cool. And he actually does it. I got a free T-shirt from him once. It's real nice. <laughs> I feel like Superman when I'm wearing that thing. You know, it's got like that big thing on the front, the big R. <laughs> <laughs> If people want to find you, rogerwhitney.com, they can look you up there. The book has a wonderful framework, and it and it talks about life beyond money as well and, and how to have a wonderful retirement. You can start that much earlier in life than I think past generations have, but it takes time to plan it out and work through it and to pressure test it. So I encourage you to do that. Thank you for joining us, Roger. It was great having you today. Yeah, it was not long enough. It was great. I encourage you to check out Roger's site, rogerwhitney.com, and his new book, Rock Retirement. And the special offer he has for you at rogerwhitney.com forward slash richer soul for a chance to win a free book. He also has a great podcast called Retirement Answer Man. Today, we talked about how the power of mentors and coaches... What's preventing you from moving forward, and who are you putting on your team to help build the life you deserve? Taking no action creates a far worse outcome in life than trying something and failing. Today's action step. Plan out what you want your future to look like. One easy way to do that is the new SWAT plan I'm offering for 2018. You can learn more at richersoul.com forward slash SWAT to see how to pressure test your financial future and find opportunities unique to you to create or increase your income streams. By examining your strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, you can help to ensure success in life. Some small course corrections today can have a massive impact in the future. Is there someone you know who would benefit from what we talked about today? Please share the episode as it helps you to build social capital, create better relationships, and start better conversations with the people you know, and they'll appreciate you for it. Thanks for listening. You can always get me at Rocky at Richer Soul. I'd love to hear from you and how this episode or any other is making an impact in your life. Have an abundant week.